Um, welcome back, everyone. I don't know if anyone else dropped out, but it seems like I just did and I'm back now. Um, I listened to Amara and Mel's and did a little jig with that music because that's what my soul moved me to do. Um, I hope you guys did too. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce the next session on civic and political imagination at the city scale. And someone who works in city government, um, I'm particularly excited to hear from these speakers. So I'll hand over to Gabriella to introduce the session. Hello, everybody, again. I am particularly delighted to um, introduce this session because in many ways, having worked in government myself, even though I've been a recovering citizen, if you will, for the last two years, really changed my notion of what is possible in terms of the public arena and with new tools to make reality malleable. So we have a stellar crew today to give us to have a conversation with. And why the city scale, for starters? Why, why focus on this in terms of imagination infrastructure? I think we've heard over and over nowadays of the importance of cities and this increased urbanization of the world that 50% uh, of the population will live in, in is living in cities right now by 2000 and by 2050 it will be 70% though actually regions such as Latin America where both Teddy and myself are from it already reached 70% It's actually nowadays nearing 80% um, so it's an Im incredibly important motion in terms of the urbanization of cities and at the same time we don't necessarily seem to have a lot of interesting imaginaries around cities that have traveled across the world, like the, perhaps the most predominant one is the smart cities lexicon, which I think everybody on this panel will tell you is actually not necessarily the most interesting or provocative way of thinking about urban culture writ large. So in many ways, it, it leads me to think that this so-called crisis of the imagination is actually not necessarily a lack of an imagination, but perhaps an excess of it in the wrong spaces. So basically, how do we start rethinking the urban political imagination that has been greatly sequestered by party politics, by corporations, by a language of binaries? And when I talk about politics, I don't necessarily mean party politics, but politics as polis, as city, as the return to first principles. How do we want to live together? How do we want to move together? How do we want to keep healthy together? And even as ontological politics, if you will, a way of being in the world, which basically when at the city scale throws us into deep relationality. So when I was chief creative officer of Mexico City heading Laboratorio para la Ciudad, which was the experimental arm slash creative think tank for the Mexico City government, one of the things that we really try to do is bring the humanities and the urban political scientists, sciences into deep conversation, because in many ways there is a lot of fantastic tools such as data driven policy, but there are certain things that are being left out of the conversation that perhaps are more akin to how we make meaning interestingly enough and, and historically and now and that I think all of the people on this in this conversation today actually bring to the forefront centering urban culture centering civics understand the understanding of urban imaginaries and how our social and subjective re, um, realities actually do influence a larger greater whole so today we will speak a bit about this, we have four fabulous people that enter the city in very different ways, different generations, different geographies, different ways of engaging with the political and the civic, and cities not as machines, but as cultural artifacts that we're all continuously creating together. And this will completely switch us into a different register of how we can think about the urbanscape. So we have today with us Cristina Dane, who is a British social campaigner deeply committed to youth rights and to food security. We have Michele, who's in charge of the Office for Civic Imagination in the city of Bologna, Italy. And we have the duo of Teddy Cruz and Fona Foreman, who are principals in Estudio Cruz and Foreman, a research-based political and architectural practice in San Diego, investigating issues on informal urbanization, civic infrastructure, and public culture. So all of them were given a prompt that you read in the agenda that basically says, we have done cities and democracy a great disservice by thinking we could bypass deep engagement with the political, relational, and dynamic nature of cities and societies by trying to skip the difficult questions through mainly technocratic perspectives. As if the main mission of humanity was efficiency and productivity, instead of making efficiency and productivity just another tool for a larger social purpose. But political questions are first and foremost questions for the imagination. So we will hear from each of them a seven to 10 minute reaction to the prompt. And then we will have for half an hour, a freewheeling conversation that I'm very much looking forward to. So Teddy and Fona, take it away. 
Thank you so much, Gabriella, for that really provocative and wonderful opening um, to this session. So many of the themes that you've hit on are central for us. So Teddy and I will tag team here. Teddy is sharing his screen. Okay, so we see the border region between San Diego, California and Tijuana, Mexico as a microcosm of all of the injustices and indignities experienced by vulnerable people across the globe political violence, climate disruption, accelerating migration, rising nationalism, border building everywhere, deepening inequality and the steady decay of public thinking. We live and work a few miles away from the child detention centers that will forever stain this period of American history. San Diego Tijuana has become a lightning rod for American nativism. And although the news cameras are gone, Tens of thousands of Central American migrants wait at the wall for asylum that never comes, and until recently, separated forcibly from their children. It has been particularly devastating in recent years to witness the emotional impact on children, their fear, and the inevitable psychic internalization of being socially and morally marginalized. In order to confront these crises, We've been thinking strategically about cultural, institutional, and spatial transformation in the border region. We've designed a system that connects our design lab on our campus with conditions in the field and have built a network of sanctuary spaces on both sides of the wall called the UCSD, that's our campus, community stations which in the context of this conversation, we propose as a cross-border infrastructure for civic imagination. Here, universities and communities meet to share knowledges and resources and to collaborate on research, dialogue, cultural and educational activities and urban design build projects, including migrant housing and environmental infrastructure. <clears throat> Several core commitments, what we call building blocks, ground our research-based practice of imagination infrastructuring. As we move through our talk, you'll encounter a few yellow pages that are drawn from our two new books, Spatializing Justice Building Blocks and Socializing Architecture Top-Down, Bottom-Up, just published by the MIT Press and Haja Kantz. So I'll begin by introducing a couple of core building blocks, and then Teddy will take you on a brief visit to two of our UCSD community station sites. Our main aspiration in these spaces is to cultivate a cross-border civic imagination, a new citizenship culture in the San Diego Tijuana border region, a sense of belonging that is defined not by the nation state or the documents you carry in your pocket, by, but by the shared interests and aspirations among people who inhabit a violently disrupted civic space. We reject ideas of citizenship that fragment and divide rather than unite. We seek to inspire more inclusive imaginaries of belonging and coexistence in this contested territory. We believe public space must be a public good activated for civic dialogue and infused with resources to increase public knowledge, solidarity, and capacity for political and environmental collective action. Our community stations are a model of urban co-development between public universities, municipalities, and community organizations to build spaces of dignity in the city's periphery, programmed for education, civic activity. Each community station is designed, funded, built, programmed, and maintained collaboratively between our campus and the community. For us, urban justice is a distributive concept. It entails not only redistributing resources, but also redistributing knowledges. As a distributed system of public spaces transgressing the border wall, the community stations specialize social justice. They are a collaborative educational platform and a model of shared urban intervention. We claimed, in fact, that the economic and programmatic power of our public university can be leveraged for co-developing the city with migrant communities. We have built four in total, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana, and we will share with you two that focus on emergency and migrant housing on each side of the border. The UCSD CASA Community Station is a partnership with the nonprofit CASA Familiar, a 30-year-old community-based social service organization. 
It is located in the border neighborhood of San Isidro, site of the busiest land crossing in the Western Hemisphere. The UCSD CASA Community Station begins with a neighborhood-based urban framework to hybridize public space and a social housing. So a parcel size social infrastructure is made of spaces for cultural and economic activity, synergizing university, philanthropic, and community assets. An old church becomes a community theater flanked by social service pavilions and outdoor civic classroom. And this public space is threaded by social housing, all mediated by pedestrian alleys. We completed construction of this station in February, just before COVID lockdowns. Um, our grassroots organization partner, uh, partner, Casa Familiar, has become effectively an alternative developer of affordable housing for its own community, and public space was the detonator. What we want to say here primarily is that social housing takes on a different meaning when it is threaded into spaces for social programming, summoning residents to participate in the development of local economy and cultural productivity. This is an integrated social spatial system that is programmed by university and community, synergizing spaces, programs, resources, and people. Our programming focuses on cultural processes that expose injustice and increase neighborhood capacity. Let's imagine a small coalition of local artists, uh, neighborhood activists, and neighborhood youth collaborating with university curator, theater script writers, and visual artists who come together to co-produce a play or a musical performance that, it, that explores an urgent issue facing the community enacted by local youth in the community theater or outdoor pavilions. These cultural productions are rooted in neighborhood stories and become bottom-up evidentiary material to increase public knowledge and policy transformation. The Casa Community Station exemplifies a couple of building blocks in our practice. In conditions of poverty, housing needs to be embedded in an infrastructure of social, economic, and cultural support. In other words, we must rethink affordable housing from autonomous units into relational systems. Housing is public infrastructure. Density should not be measured as an abstract number of objects per people or, or people per area. Density must be understood instead as the intensity of social and economic exchanges per area. Migrant neighborhoods have taught us that these exchanges mobilized by bottom-up urbanization is the DNA for democratizing the city into more inclusive and plural environments. The sweat equity of architects, cultural producers, and community leaders, the economic equity of public universities, and municipal protocols for accessing public space can be bundled, aggregated, to enable communities to develop their own neighborhoods. That's been our story. So moving across the border, one of our community stations in Tijuana is located in the Laureles Canyon, an informal settlement adjacent to the border wall. The UCSD Alacran community station occupies the most rugged, precarious, and polluted sub-basin in the canyon. It is a partnership with Embajadores de Jesus, a religious organization led by activist pastors Gustavo Banda and Zaida Guillén. With limited resources, they built a refugee camp to provide shelter, food, and basic services to hundreds of Haitian and Central American refugees while they navigate on just asylum processes in the US and Mexico. And with the help of skilled migrants, they began building their own emergency housing. We have established a long-term partnership to co-develop a community station here to increase refugee housing capacity. And to do this, we are engaging material resources from global factories that sit in the periphery of these informal settlements to gain access to cheap labor. We are adapting lightweight metal shelving systems for global export into structural scaffolds for informal housing. Together, we are building Santuario Frontera. The housing scaffolds will be built first uh, leaving the interiors as planned open systems. In order to sustain the construction process over time, we are designing what we call a sanctuary economy, embedding housing in spaces of fabrication, training, small-scale economic development. We began construction last summer. 
the migrant community assembled the, the, the Mechalux shelving systems into housing frames. And we, are, we also began the healing of the topography, creating hydrofiltration channels, uh, garden rooms, terracing, and water collection systems, advising, uh, advancing migrant housing as a restorative ecological infrastructure. We are now developing a full-on sanctuary neighborhood with social services, a school, hydroponic farm, and economic incubators. A health clinic and a collective kitchen are now under construction where our students can develop social and food justice programming with the migrant community. So to conclude, there's so much more to say about the community stations and our amazing partners and what we do together in these spaces. While the stations focus on different issues reflecting the priorities of each community, they all aspire to foster solidarity through civic imagination and collective agency. We want to cultivate an elastic civic identity here from the bottom up, ultimately to reimagine jurisdiction in a militarized border zone. We curate unwalling experiments that dissolve the wall using visual tools like diagrams and radical cartographies to situate border neighborhoods within broader spatial ecologies of circulation and interdependence. The idea of the bioregion, the binational watershed system, for example, has been a powerful imaginary for activating this more elastic civic thinking in the border region from local to regional to continental and ultimately to global scales. We see elasticity as a civic skill the ability to stretch and return between local and more expansive ways of thinking, to understand one's challenges within broader processes and to envision opportunities for solidarity across walls. Thank you so much. Thank you. So elastic thinking to stretch and return, I love that. And one of the things that I'll, I think you'll see in this panel and we will hear from Michele next, is that in many ways what working within the context of cities, working with politics actually needs these big ideas and these imaginations to actually entangle with that so-called reality. So thank you so much for your work. And Michele, we'd love to hear from you next. Okay, I can uh, open my, uh, okay, perfect. Uh, hi everybody and thank you Tadi and Fona. Um, I'm, I'm leaving something uh, very similar in Italy now. Um, I'm very uh, touched about this emotion. Uh, so I'm gonna explain uh, what I'm doing in Bologna. Bologna is a, a not enormous city uh, in Italy, in the north of Italy, between Venice and Florence. I'm in charge of an office called uh, Civic Imagination uh, inside a foundation funded by the municipality and the University of Bologna. We have a clear mission. We have to push forward the innovation of the city uh, in order to design a city shared with the citizen, shared with the communities. We have to work uh, on the ground, uh, going outside our institution. And in these years, we have uh, uh, created new paradigms, uh, putting uh, uh, the community at the center of our attention. Uh, maybe community is the message uh, reframing uh, McLuhan uh, uh, motto uh, because I think that we have to uh, think about uh, uh, the modern uh, approaches that we have to um, reframe uh, with the globalization processes uh, even more with the um, digital revolution we are facing new paradigms. Uh, the people don't trust the government, the people don't trust to us. The classical uh, approaches to participation are in crisis, like the long-term uh, plans. And uh, the people want to reorganize uh, themselves and uh, in a, a less structured and open uh, way. Um, they don't want to uh, create hierarchical structure um, but they want to be more open, uh, collaborative. And this is a good point to um, uh, design a new way to be a public, to invent public policy, uh, going beyond the modern approaches, uh, the 19th century approaches, uh, but at the center, uh, 
facing these unprecedented uh, challenges, we have to put relation. Uh, it's not about uh, uh, participatory budgeting or a stakeholder map or a digital tool. It's about, uh, it's about relation, it's about us, it's about our bodies, emotion, empathy. Um, so we have to go outside our box. We have to go outside our institution uh, because inside our institution, there is no creativity. There is not radical imagination. And uh, we, have, we, we need engagement. Uh, there is a, an empty space. We are refilled the space that uh, in the modern um, age was uh, full of uh, parties of union. And uh, we have to reconnect with the, the, um, our citizen and communities that want to take care about the city. Uh, they want to take uh, care of the city and they want to take uh, part of the governance. Uh, and this is clear also in the private companies or your ONG. Um, uh, we have got a lot of uh, uh, companies or associations that want to seeking uh, uh, in, to involve employment, uh, employers, uh, customer or activist. Uh, they need new organization model to go outside uh, the traditional way to be enterprises or organization. But this is not, uh, uh, we don't need target. We don't need uh, uh, stakeholder. We need uh, partner, we need the pact. We need a new grammar uh, to restore our role uh, relationship with our citizen. Uh, is not about a slogan, it's not about only a motto, it's attention uh, and we have to change the way we uh, think about the law, uh, the organization and the communication. Uh, thinking about the law, uh, we have to design a flexible law, it's not an, uh, an oxymoron. Uh, we need to uh, create uh, uh, a new way to understand the needs and the creativity of our people going outside the traditional approaches. Um, we need uh, also in management, uh, we have to be more adherent uh, to the models, to the real need. Um, so I think that uh, we need to speak, uh, uh, to design a new world, starting from speaking about power. Historically, power is unbalanced. Uh, there are those who have it and uh, those who don't. And we have to bring, uh, if we want to engage uh, communities, we have to bring uh, some power to the top and bring it to the bottom. And people want to have a clear message, want to be, uh, want to take care of uh, uh, parks, streets, uh, schools, uh, buildings, want to take care of something concrete. We need to speak about power. Second, we need time. After uh, a long period of neoliberalism approaches, people don't trust to us. Uh, we, the government have, uh, has closed the hospital, schools, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, so we need to, uh, we need time to restore uh, if we want to uh, uh, become a friend, we have to take a coffee and then uh, uh, going uh, for a dinner and after for a weekend and after all for a summer holiday. Uh, but this need time. Uh, third place, we, need, we knew that Bologna is completely different from London, uh, from uh, LA. Uh, but inside Bologna, we have got uh, a lot of different places. And inside the same uh, neighborhood, we have got a lot of different uh, souls. So if you want to speak with some mothers and fathers, if you want to speak with some uh, youngers or uh, riders, we have to adapt our tone of voice. We have to recognize that uh, we need to change with our cross-media approaches the way we use uh, uh, our uh, leadership. And the last question, the last word is empathy. We have to change the way we organize, we think about leadership. Uh, 
without any paternalistic approaches, like uh, an intersectional perspective, like in feminism, uh, we have to be more horizontal and more transparency. Uh, transparency. So this scenario uh, is fundamental to speak about uh, some tension that I'm seeing uh, um, uh, in the city, in Bologna. Quite in Paris uh, or in Barcelona, where uh, um, the municipality has adopted uh, the proximity pact uh, in Paris and neighborhood plan in Barcelona. Uh, in Bologna, we are creating a, a system uh, putting community as the center. Um, it's not about uh, a vote every five years. It's not about a co-design process to design a park. It's like something to, um, is a continued tension. Uh, in this uh, little publication that I'm gonna share in the chat, you can see clearly that uh, is a tension that began in the 2014 with the, with the introduction of the common goods regulation. And municipality of Bologna create this collabor collabor collaboration pact, um, enabling the energy of the community, uh, recognizing the individually or collectively um, people that can take care of tangible assets uh, like square buildings, green area, or intangible uh, ones uh, as like uh, projects for inclusion, cohesion, uh, education. So uh, after this year, we have got uh, hundreds of packs, hundreds of community that want to, that are part in a co-production power in the city. It's something revolutionary. There is no passive uh, uh, citizen uh, we have uh, active citizens that push forward for uh, a better life, more uh, power, more spaces. And after this uh, invention, we create uh, uh, neighborhood labs, spaces where people can uh, share ideas and problems uh, and speaking with the politician to understand the direction of the municipality. Uh, is not normally uh, everybody we are close in our houses in a molecular way to understand the participation is uh, the period of the do it ourself uh, politics uh, like in Greta movement and we create labs where everybody can uh, push uh, with the others can share inside with the others uh, we create a school of neighborhoods uh, empowering the capacitation of the communities, no formal communities, um, looking for new competencies. And we create uh, uh, houses for the neighborhood, um, giving more than 100 uh, uh, public buildings to the community, uh, creating an infrastructure uh, where the municipality go beyond and uh, uh, on the stage, uh, we can see the people, the community. So uh, in Bologna, we are creating this clear uh, process is an institutional learning process, designing a, a new way to, uh, to stay in the proximity, to stay uh, with new competencies. Uh, for this, we create uh, uh, six uh, uh, proximity agents, one of each neighborhood, and they work like uh, community manager uh, just with a clear mission to speak and, and clear and, and work with the, with the people without any target, uh, staying, staying with them. And we create a new institution, Fondazione Innovazione Urbana, where I work, because the municipality um, uh, has, has understood that uh, we have to create something new we can reform the old world. We are to reinvent something new. So I'm going to the end of my intervention. I think that uh, uh, about this story, uh, we can uh, we can see we can say I can say that the civic imagination is a complex world, but represent the uh, the, the ability to combine uh, listen to the city, administration capacity going beyond the bureaucratic approach, um, 
playing with CD can back, uh, activation uh, and public action. Because in these years, we have seen uh, reducing the power, and the vision of the public, but we need a vision of the public to, um, to make more um, flexible the way we want to organize ourselves. It's not about something uh, uh, hard, it's about a strategy that puts human and social capital at the center of a new way to design local strategies and politics. Thank you so much, Michele. I think it's so important, this revitalization of both the vocabulary and the vision of the public. Cristina, we would love to have your voice. We can't hear you. Perhaps while we, we, we can't hear you still, Cristina, but perhaps while the lovely uh, production team who's on the back end can give you a hand with, with technical issues, perhaps we can start with a, a couple, uh, one question, I think, and then we'll, we'll catch up with, oh, I think you're back. Can, let's see, can you speak? Hey, can you hear me? There you are. Well, okay, done. brilliant. <laughs> All right, I had a hold in because there's a bit of construction work in the background, but I'm just going to speak extra loudly. Um, I was just saying thank you so much for having me, and um, the previous speakers have been excellent. Um, I wanted to start by telling my personal story, my personal connection to um, the prompt. So I'm a young black woman growing up in London. Um, and I come from a working class family. My family are originally from Tigray in Ethiopia. So there are already dimensions to my identity um, that play out really interestingly in a city like London. Um, but I'm gonna hone in on food and my journey with food um, living in London. Uh, I was 15 years old when I realized I was living in a food desert. Um, a food desert is uh, a, an area or a high street uh, with little to no access to nutritious foods, but um, tons and tons of uh, junk food at a very affordable price. How did I find this out? Um, I was climate campaigning at the time, uh, striking, not going to school, going to protest instead. <laughs> um, and I was really trying to figure out um, what the relation between climate and food was because um, the food system is the third biggest polluter but you never really hear the food system being talked about like big oil so how, how do I change that as a climate campaigner um, anyway I was talking to my manager at the time I was doing work experience at a communications agency and he told me to apply for this um, organization that was just starting up by this chef called Jamie Oliver and I really knew nothing about food I just wanted to reiterate that like I was just like yeah it's it's something I enjoy it's something that I love culturally it's but I knew nothing about um food bigger than my personal relationship with it so I attended a couple um sessions um kind of training sessions at this new organization called Bite Back 2030 and I found out um pretty quickly that I was just completely betrayed by um my local food environment um, I found out I was twice as likely to develop diet related ill health because of where I lived. I was likely to die around 10 years earlier than my wealthier counterparts. Um, again, all because I lived in a food desert, which is a term that I'd never heard in school, um, a term that was never spoken about um, online, on social media, amongst my friends. Um, and I realized that it had really adverse effects on my life. Um, so I started campaigning at Bite Back um, and I just kept thinking more and more about food systems and food environments and the fact that I've been made to feel like food is such a personal thing, but not but not really recognizing that, you know, these 
big 10 corporations control 90% of what I eat and that 70% of my diet as a young person is ultra processed food. And that is because I live in an urban area, right? It's, it, it's not the same if you're living in a rural area. It's, it's because I live in a council estate in South London. Um, so I got really angry. I got really, really angry. Um, and so did other young people at Bite Back 2030, where this amazing youth led movement um, fighting uh, for a fairer food system in the UK. Um, and we launched a couple campaigns, um, my most notable one being free school meals. And that was around ensuring that young people um, had a right to free school meals over the over the holidays um, and particularly during lockdown. Um, but the, mo the more closely related one to food environments is the junk food marketing campaign, um, which is essentially um, to ban junk food marketing in the UK. Um, in the past four years, young people have been advertised 16 billion ads, which equates to 500 ads per second in the UK, which is insane. And that's online, that's in our emails. They bombard us with our favorite influencers. They put product placement in our um, you know, Netflix shows, but also like not just online, on the streets, we have tons of street advertising for, for junk food. And um, what's even worse is if you're in an area of high deprivation, the junk food increase, right? Um, if you're in an area of high deprivation, the actual junk food stores and where they're located in proximity to schools and um, you know youth hubs are going to increase. Um, and I was realizing this because you know it's it's literally all around me. Like I live in a deprived area, but my school at the time. Um, was across the bridge into Westminster, which is obviously a very wealthy part of London. So I would make that trip every single day, realizing how my food environment changes as I step into a wealthier area. Um, so, you know, infrastructure was, the infrastructure of London was, just became very obvious to me, even just walking into the city, the financial center of, of London, um, not just from a food perspective, but even just from being a woman and being a young person, it's like, this place isn't built for me. It's not really built with me in mind. Um, so a question that um, I always pose to uh, our young people at Bite Back is, how do you want to redesign that food system to work for you? And that's something we've, we've asked constantly. And it's, it's about what Gabriella was saying earlier. There's tons of imagination. It's just not going into the right places. So um, that's a question we always come back to. How do we reimagine, redesign a food system that works for young people? Because at the moment in the UK, party politics is prioritized over child health. And so is company profits. Um, so... One of the steps we've taken to kind of think about this um, properly is what's already been done and um, what's working. So in the in, in London specifically, um, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, um, introduced a junk food ad ban um, just to trial essentially like what like what the impact our food environment has on our health. And um, research has shown that the ban directly led to 94 thousand fewer cases of obesity um, and a, which is a 4.8 percent decrease and um, the same study found that 3,000 fewer cases of diabetes were found and 2,000 fewer cases of ca cardiovascular disease which shows the impact that our food environment literally has on our health um, and as a young person that's kind of terrifying but also shows that like there is so much scope to change this and there is real impact um, despite what people want to make you feel, which is actually you being obese is your fault. It's not. It's our food environment. Um, so we think of it in three ways, healthier streets, healthier screens and healthier schools. What are young people looking at when they're on their phone? Um, and what is in, what is the encouraged image of, of London and of of all the pop culture references that they have that's a pretty big one and I think one that's obvious with the advertising going on at the moment um schools is really interesting because um free school meals aren't excellent in the UK and not everyone is entitled to them not even um a, oh sorry for the construction um but not even um a million children who live in the UK aren't eligible who are living in poverty um 
But even when they do get that free school meal provision, is it nutritious? Is it advertising what we want to be advertised, what we want our young people to be eating, essentially? Um, it doesn't tend to. So cool, they, they skip on their free school meals um, and they leave school. What's there when they leave school? It's a junk food shop, it's a chicken shop, it's a shop that has loads of ultra processed food and at affordable price, but none that actually provides um, kind of nutritious food um, and as well as that, um, these chicken shops are the only safe and dry place um, for young people to hang out because there are no that, you know, due to austerity, austerity in the UK, there are no community centres anymore. There aren't any youth hubs where young people can just be young and hang out without um, kind of being exploited by junk food, essentially. Um, so that's one thing that came out of our conversations with young people. They want youth hubs. They want places just so that they can feel safe and stay out of the streets, um, but not have to eat junk food or have to go to a McDonald's because there's free Wi-Fi there. Um, and the last thing is, um, oh, I kind of hit that. S streets and schools are kind of um, together, but also our high streets. So how do we change our food deserts to food oases? that are actually accessible and attractive to young people. And a lot of that is about reimagining what healthy looks like. So if I ask a young person now, what does healthy look like to you? They're gonna say a boring green bowl of salad, like just leaves, like they don't they don't see it as something that's enticing to them. Um, so, so how do we make healthy food attractive in, the, in their cultural context as well? London is so diverse, so multicultural. There are so many cuisines um, that we could be platforming, take junk food out the spotlight and put healthy food in the spotlight, but make it something that, you know, is familiar to young people and attractive to them and accessible to them. Um, and that is all around us in advertising. That, that's something that we could change. Um, so yeah that's that's kind of my relationship with my london um and yeah i don't know if i've gone over time sorry if i have <laughs> thank you that was incredibly inspiring and i'll actually start with you and work my way back to the very beginning um for the the q a so i think one of the things that you pointed towards has has been very much on my mind um when i was also you know in engaging with a megalopolis, which is the dangers of a monolithic imagination of thinking that a city is one thing or that can be read under one optic, because as you well said, like the very different populations in London are living a completely different London. Um, so I think that the, 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 this idea of spatial justice, which basically means that things are very unequally distributed within cities is incredibly interesting, as well as the other question to your point of uh, reimagining healthy, which is democratizing imagination as well. Like, you know, that, that perhaps is a common in terms of everything that is intangible to a society that also needs to be redistributed in, in a very different way. So fascinating comments, and I'm so enthralled with your work. Perhaps I'd, I'd ask some interesting questions in relationship to this, to this conversation, because Teddy has worked within government and with government. Michel has as well. Why, why is it of interest, for example, and how do you see that relationship between your activism and your agenda and the political, the policy bit? Because I know that you're also advising on youth policy uh, uh, on Sadiq, well, you know, just like advising Sadiq Khan's team, as well as all of the things that you're saying, like, what interests you about this? Because, of course, like, you know, I had several activists on my team, and we actually had to go through a certain turbulence in terms of passing from one space to another, because many of the activist tools are actually um, in battle with government, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think about this? What are the possibilities and perils and pitfalls of a re of creating a relationship with with this, this other space and how does that lead and how did that transform your views on political civic infrastructure imagination and the rest um great question i think uh you caught me at an interesting time because i it's very turbulent times in the kind of political scene in the uk it's just craziness um, and I find myself being very burnt out by um, engaging with politics and just policy generally. Um, the junk food marketing ban is an example. Um, we first achieved that policy, which was to um, ban it online and to introduce a 9 p.m. watershed on junk food advertising on TV um, in 2021 under Boris Johnson's government. 
Um, and since then, it's literally just been ping pong um, because of people coming in and out, um, certain like um, scandals that have meant that, you know, child health takes a back seat. And instead, you know, they're going to focus on um, ensuring that these backbenchers support this politician and this and that. And so, um, as a young person engaging with policy, it's quite difficult because firstly, you never feel represented because there just aren't young people in politics, not in the UK anyway. Um, and secondly, particularly with food environments, um, it's quite difficult to get these people that don't understand poverty um, and you know have never experienced it or have never tried to go out of their way to know what food desert is or something like that. So to you know, to come down to your level and, and um, actually care about something like this. Um, but that's why you have to make the economic arguments for it. Uh, the PwC released a report um, about how free school meals can be really, really beneficial um, to, the, to the wider economy. Um, same with, you know, junk food marketing. If you have less people that are ill, you're going to have more economically active people over a longer period of time. Um, so that's kind of, and I think, I forgot to mention the biggest thing, um, being nonpartisan is so important. Uh, you don't know where your allies are. Some people can really sympathize because, uh, you know, they've struggled with diet related ill health, but they're perhaps on a party that you, you know, may not align with personally. Um, but you can, by, by creating a coalition, uh, you ensure that the policies you're fighting for last beyond just this like four year regime. Um, and obviously you're, you're bringing people together instead of dividing people through what you're fighting for. Um, so yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll actually go to Fona because I know that you need to run off to pick up or rather leave your kids at school because it's very early where, where Fona and Teddy are. Um, so Fona, I'm, I was very interested in many of the in-between and the relational uh, optics that both Teddy and you take on your work. In terms of borders, if we believe the geopolitical boundaries of our political systems, it's one thing. Once you actually see the flow of people and you look at it under a relational lens, then suddenly San Diego and Tijuana make all of the sense in the world to be working together just because you know the Mexican-American uh, border is the biggest flow of people across the world. Another in between that I love, if you could just respond in any, in any way you, you wish, is of what happens when we actually start uh, blurring the boundaries between the private and the public, the individual and the collective. And as you mentioned, like looking at housing as public infrastructure actually leads to very different ways of, of thinking of something that we consider incredibly private, but is actually fraught with politics and could be thought of in terms of public, but uh, and actually we're designing policy for the, a different thing. Let's say Tatiana Bilbao has mentioned before a Mexican architect that the policy around social housing doesn't allow for collective kitchens, for example, it's illegal. Um, they made this as a protective measure, but what does that actually entail? So if you could speak to this in betweenness, to this relational optic, uh, also university cities, I mean, there's so many interesting blurring of boundaries there that again, look at the relational first. Yeah, thank you so much. So obviously the border is reproduced in so many ways across every city, right? So we're trying to figure out how borders can become more porous and to create linkages and connections among people, among institutions that are artificially divided, either physically or the kind of barriers that Christina talked about in the city that are invisible until you, until you actually cross them and then the consciousness of division becomes very, very clear. Um, I get, there, there's so much to say about the blurring of these boundaries and how you get them done. But for us, the the key really has been through, co Christina called it coalition. Uh, Michaela referred to partners, not stakeholders. These ways of bridging spaces through social partnership and recognizing shared interests and aspirations across these borders that define the limits of our thinking and the limits of our, of our practices. So it's all about coalition building and trust so that we can survive these sort of ebbs and flows of governance, right? So every four years, things don't have to get reorganized. The, the coalitions can survive them. And I mean, Teddy can say more about the, you know, about the, 
about the ways that we built these coalitions to push against policy that prohibits more collective ways of inhabiting the city. We always say that zoning, right, has to stop being punitive. Zoning has to be reimagined to open up new collective and plural possibilities of inhabiting the city. I guess we've seen ourselves, Gabriella, as inhabiting that middle space as facilitators or curators of bringing up the needs and capacities and aspirations of the bottom up to push up against policy and, and distribution mechanisms that completely miss the actual needs and aspirations of communities. We see ourselves as urban curators in that sense. And I think the important thing there uh, that all of you embody um, is basically the inhabitors of gaps, as well yes. as hybrid and fluid beings that you have to take on whatever role is needed from the circumstance and not necessarily a predefined role, which is something that I've been in discussion with with my students at, at UCL. I'll come back to you in a second, Teddy. Um, just Michele, talking about locality as a way, at the same time, how cities actually overflow space and time, if you will. One of the things that I really uh, was so interested in, in my first and last visit to Bologna when we met in person is the history of Bologna, like the communist past, a, a like a collective deep rehearsal of cooperatives, of communal life, of really thinking from a very different register about what it means to be a citizen of Bologna, that I think that muscle has actually very much led to a mayor being able to embrace a vocabulary of civics and imagination in a much easier fashion, not without its tensions, I'm sure. But if you could share like this, this historical lens to what you're doing now and how the history of Bologna has influenced this, that would be fantastic. Yes, sure. Um, Bologna has an incredible, vibrant uh, uh, DNA. Uh, historically, we, uh, Bologna was the most communist uh, city in the Western world. And, um, and is uh, the innovation labs of, the, of the Italy. We, in, in Bologna, we create the first uh, kindergarten, public kindergarten in the 60s. We create the first uh, palaces for the people in the 70s the first uh, um, place for the LBTQ plus uh, community in the city center uh, in, was in the uh, 18, 1918. And that mayor want to create a place inside the city because he want that the, the citizen have to be um, clear that everybody needs a place to stay and to dance was incredible and this is our history but uh, there is also a negative way to see uh, this incredible um, vibrant cooperative uh, uh, movement that uh, wants to push forward bologna is that uh, we are clashed by tradition mm -hmm. uh, for this is in, is i love my work because I want to go beyond the solution. And when now I'm, for example, now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working a lot with educators and professors and, uh, and they are uh, living in a traditional institution school. Uh, so uh, they, have, uh, they are colonized by the middle-aged white men that uh, think the school institution. Uh, so I have to bring them, the educators, and uh, shock them uh, because imagination is not a creative and solitary uh, uh, muscle. It's not a, something romantic. Uh, it's a process. It's something that we have to organize, to design. So I have to bring them using empathy, uh, knowing, knowing the, the point of view of educators or elderly or youngest, whatever, and step by step organize something uh, stronger than the present. Looking for our past. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I discover this history about the first club for the LBTQ uh, club, I was to my measure and, and say to him, look, in the 80s, without any uh, this political discussion, 
was the mayor that decided a thing from a, uh, with a, a top-down decision uh, after uh, seeing the, the, the needs of the, of the citizen. Um, so Bologna is an incredible city to experiment, but it's a city where we, have, we want to innovate without, in, without changing. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it's, very, it's very interesting to work with this. That is, that is really interesting because I think the DNA of cities is something to devil into. Who other city has been, what it can become, what it thinks of itself, and, hence, and how important urban imaginaries are in the way that we inhabit it and the decisions that we take. Um, I actually wanted to ask all of you about pedagogies, about in terms of this new citizen culture. We won't have time, but Teddy, perhaps you could mention, um, as we near the end of this session, something that I'm, I'd be very interested in, if you could wax poetic and speculative with us, what do you think, knowing that you are an architect and an artist, an urbanist, a pedagogue, so many things, what what would you think about um, imagination infrastructuring? Like, what what could this entail? Like, what could be the juicy future of what very much related to the things that you and Fona mentioned? Yes, and I think it gathers and you know summarizes everything that everybody has said because at, at bottom, I think. It is about accompanying this possibility uh, of a new civic imagination, a, 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 the possibility of producing a new social contract, which embedded into it is really, as Michele said, a very uh, specific process. I think that we have taken it for granted. Many of us activists that are working on this, we think that things might will magically occur just by our own uh, commitments uh, and so on. I think that requires a lot of work. That facilitation requires a lot of very specific strategic thinking, a new form of institutional critique. I think it's about sharing responsibilities across sectors. Uh, so it's a larger project, obvious, obviously, that depends on a new political leadership uh, that really is organized around empathy, interdependence, uh, about the fact that the survival of the individual depends on the health of the collective. Uh, it is a, a new type of public uh, thinking. It's not, it's not the, the typical patronizing social welfare state for a moment. It will have to be reorganized around other types of uh, synergies and interdependencies. What has mobilized our thinking, really, uh, uh, Fona and myself, is a critique that a society that is anti-taxes, for example, anti-public investment, anti-immigrants, only commits uh, civic suicide. So I think that uh, it is about a new type of uh, public investment to support and nurture that uh, infrastructure for imagination without that investment. That is again about sharing responsibility and ultimately, yes, urban pedagogy, uh, civic education, us who teach in a university and in fact, we mobilize the resources of the universities, top down resources, in order to support bottom up intelligence, right? That synergy, that uh, mediation, our practices will have to be mediatory to link the top down and the bottom up. That it can be organized by civic education and, 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 and through that notion or possibility, we always believe on Antanas Mokus, you know, uh, uh, the former mayor of Bogota, Colombia, who said before transforming the city, we first need to transform social norms. The investments in realigning uh, our reciprocity, uh, the understanding that we need to nurture a new sense of coexistence in a city is important. So yes, investing uh, in a new idea of public space, yes, that must have collective kitchens, that must have the kind of idea of communities being in charge of their own modes of productivity uh, is, is essential uh, for all of this. Uh, in other words, public space is our, our, our main epicenter, but it's a different idea of public space. It's not just the beautification uh, of public space or the neutrality of pop-ups that just suspend our commitments into a, 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 for a more robust public infrastructure investment. So public space needs to be injected with tools. And that is part of the responsibility. It's a, it's a shared responsibility across sector, investing in public space uh, so that this public space can really increase capacities truly for political action. Public space cannot just be a neutral space where things magically will occur. It needs to be more deliberately injected with resources, tools, and facilitation for this to really begin to trickle upwards in transforming institutions from the top down. 
You are also inspirational. Thank you very much both for your big ideas as well as your deep practice. I wish I could hear three hours more of you. Um, hopefully soon it will be in person. But thank you, Cristina. Thank you, Fona. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you, Michele. And hope to see you soon in the flesh. Um, thank you so much to all of you for sharing um, such grounded and kind of thoughtful possibilities around how we, the process of investing in um, and building the muscles for a new civic imagination. Um, it's so interesting to see how across different sectors, there's so many of so many resonant themes around how we make borders invisible, making them porous, how different actors across the civic space can work together differently, how we build trust slowly and enable coalitions to form, and how we use public space as an opportunity to reimagine ownership of the economy and civic connection. Um, the opportunity of, of, of cities as spaces to experiment, but also as the necessity for us to change in order for our cities to change and the key role of civic education. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be pouring over all the resources that have been shared. We now have another break and we'll be back at 3.20 for the next session. Thank you.